Hey, it's Spoonie, and it's time for the October slash September update on the progress of Kitten Space Agency. This update is coming a little bit late and on the heels of me missing September's upload, so I'm gonna kind of combine them. I was traveling in Japan for several weeks of the last month and then playing catch up when I got back, so I'm a little bit behind on recording this, but I'm here now. So let's get into it. Oh, but by the way, I was in the Ginza area of Tokyo one afternoon and I saw this incredible art installation by Kenji Yanobi, and I'm not exactly sure why, but it really reminds me of Kitten Space Agency. There's just something about it. I don't know. Can't put my finger on it. If this is your first time hearing about this game, Kitten Space Agency is the spiritual successor to Kerbal Space Program, led by Dean Hall and a team at Rocketworks that includes not only the original creator of Kerbal Space Program, Harvester, but also several influential modders from the KSP community like Blackrack, along with other seriously talented individuals. And if you haven't seen one of my videos before, I have put together a quick recap that should bring you up to speed and answer most of the basic questions that will help you follow along more easily with what's being covered in this video. If this isn't your first time seeing one of my videos, don't worry, you don't have to watch the recap again, just skip ahead to the chapter titled New Updates. First, this game is meant to be the spiritual successor to Kerbal Space Program 2. It is being built from the ground up on a custom framework called Brutal designed specifically for this game. Brutal gives the developers full control over just about everything and allows them to quickly experiment with new features and ideas, like shadows from moons on planets which went from conception to proof of concept implementation in just three hours. Yes, there will be mod support. In fact, this game is being developed with mod support as a cornerstone and everything in the game is essentially a mod itself which can be altered. The game will have multiplayer, and the groundwork for this feature is being baked into the game so that it can be more easily added when the time comes. We don't know if it will launch with this feature, but we do know that they are planning for it. The game will have interstellar travel. The game will also be DRM free, meaning you will not have to have an internet connection to play the game. The game will also, at least ideally, be free to play. This is still a little bit up in the air as the developers will obviously need to make money from the game. It may be through a pay what you want system or other voluntary support. We will have to wait for further clarification down the road, but we do know that Dean Hall very much wants this game to be released for free. While we don't have a lot of information on system requirements just yet, the game seems to already be incredibly performant, with at least some of the work being tested on a 2080 Super at 1440p, often achieving an FPS in the hundreds. This is a good sign that you probably won't need a 5090 to play this game at the higher settings with a decent frame rate. This performance boost is in part thanks to a system of rendering called spherical billboards, which swaps out pre-rendered meshes as you approach an orbital body rather than rendering them in real time you will be able to seamlessly switch from ship view to orbital view or to another ship around another body without the need for loading screens thanks to the utilization of instantiable physics and the brutal framework, which allows everything to play by its own set of rules rather than everything being tied together in a persistent scene. This also gives the modders a straightforward path to adding, editing, or completely remaking systems. And those are the key points which I hope will answer a lot of the questions those who are new to the game might have. So first up, we got some incredible new shots from Dean showing off textures, some cinematic views, and this earth rise that is probably one of my favorite pictures so far, and some additional shots of the untextured parts being created by Daishi. Again, hope I'm pronouncing that right. As always, the work here is really stunning, and to see a game look this good this early and also be performant is a huge step in the right direction by the whole team, and has me really excited for everybody to get a chance to play this alpha and see firsthand just how well it really does run. As I said in my Let's Play video showing off some KSA gameplay last month, I do admittedly have a beefier gaming computer. I'm running a 4090 with an i9-14900K and 64 gigs of RAM. I'm running the game on 2K with otherwise maxed out settings, and this game doesn't even run hard enough that all of my fans turn on. What that means is that those with machines older or lower end than mine will most likely be able to run this game on higher settings with no problem. Obviously, if you're on a 10-year-old laptop with integrated graphics, you may be turning things down. But what you see in these photos isn't some upscaled picture taken with special textures meant for cinematics. This this is the actual game and what you see here is what you're getting. It really does look like this. And next up we got a short video showing off the RCS autopilot following the new target frame of reference setting. So you can set another ship as a target and have your RCS and engines burn relative to that target rather than an orbital body. And this will make rendezvous and docking a little bit easier. I love seeing here that both craft are being controlled relative to one another and both RCS thrusters are firing at the same time so you don't have to swap back and forth trying to line things up perfectly before you can dock. But even if you do need to swap back and forth, again, this isn't like in KSP where swapping craft encounters a quick loading screen. 
In Kitten Space Agency, swapping is instantaneous and seamless. Next, Daishi gave us another look at some of the part configurations. Obviously, still without skins at this point, but we can see some of the various fuel tanks and a good look at the RCS thrusters. This capsule here is one of the medium-sized capsules, and mounted on its nose is a half-height tiny tank with its external skin toggled off to show four single RCS nozzles. I'm not exactly sure if these get placed there by the player or if we will have some RCS tanks with built-in nozzles, but either way, it's really nice to get some additional looks at the art style and parts coming along. We also got a really cool look at this same medium-sized capsule interfacing with a six-bay service module. It has recessed sockets for a heat shield, a small decoupler, and a wide door arc that opens and closes for access. This is all coming along really great, and they mention it's now time for UV unwrapping and texturing, which came just a week later. These are looking absolutely amazing. And I'm so glad and honestly a little bit relieved to see which direction the artists are taking for the vehicle parts. I say that because this is honestly a tricky one. The style can't lean entirely on hyper-realism because, you know, it's a game about cats flying rockets. But at the same time, you can't go too heavily into the cartoonish side of things either because the planets all look so incredibly real. That leaves a fairly large uncanny valley where things can get weird. So the art direction on this one is a balancing act and one that I do not envy having to take on. But in my opinion, they're absolutely nailing it so far. Everything looks really great and I'm really looking forward to seeing these in game and getting to build some custom ships, hopefully relatively soon. Next up, Lynx gave us a work in progress look at the Planet Texture Exporter. This one is going to be really exciting for modders and those looking to create their own planets and systems. This is an internal tool for artists meant for exporting planets, but it could also be used by power users and modders to export planet textures to their disk and create custom skins. This supports export resolutions up to a massive 16K, which takes just four seconds to export on the system that it was tested on. So needless to say, this will allow for quick testing and iterations. Functionally, what this does is render the planet in real time and serves as a live preview of the planet's surface. Last month, we got a look at the ground track plot that will be an in-game tool for players mapping planetary bodies, but at some point, Lynx plans to try and merge this function functionality with the ground track plot, which would also allow players to view planetary surface data and further help with planning missions and landings. JPL gave us a look at his work in progress for the closest approach markers being used for rendezvous with other vehicles, followed by Dean showing off his first rendezvous with another craft. This is awesome and something I haven't played around too much with, but now that I'm back from traveling, I do plan to play around a lot more with the Alphan, so expect to see me attempt this in one of those upcoming videos. Next, Dean gave us a better look at how lighting is evolving and the approach that they are taking to clustered lights. Akavis has implemented a system that is designed to avoid doing unnecessary calculations in areas of the screen that aren't actively being affected by lighting. This approach to clustered lighting gives an incredibly performant result, and if you'd like to dig more into exactly how it works, there is a link posted in the description of the video that gives an overview of the techniques used. Dean also showed off some of the work being done to prepare for interstellar travel. And this update in particular has me absolutely pumped because interstellar travel is probably the feature that I am looking forward to most in this game. In this clip, we can see how sprites for distant planets are becoming shadowed when facing away from the sun, allowing them to appear and sort of disappear from view depending on your angle. It's subtle, but I agree that this adds a lot to the game, especially as you might approach a new body on an interstellar mission and see its many moons appearing and disappearing as they move through the orbit. And continuing on this interstellar topic, we are given a zoom out of Jupiter to give a sense of how seamlessly this game will be able to handle scale at the interstellar level. And once again, I'm going to say the thing that stood out to me the most after playing this alpha was that you truly can switch between ships, planets, moons, camera angles, and maps instantaneously and totally seamlessly. It's really impressive. It's probably the single biggest step up in space sim games that I have played recently in terms of immersion and just fluidity of gameplay. Okay, next, Blackrack gave us another look at the improvements made to Waves. And I have to say, once again, incredible work here. Water is one of those things, much like clouds, that it's really tricky to do well. The way that light reflects off and through water is difficult to simulate in a way that doesn't constantly remind you that you're looking at a simulation. But this is looking incredible, and what's really huge here is that it will be affected by wind speed. So different planets, and even the same planet at different times or in different locations, will see a variety of wave intensity and height. I am really excited about this because the idea that this game will have weather affecting oceans and wind speed is just something I hadn't really considered being a realistic possibility given that it adds a degree of complexity to an already complex system. So for me, 
This is just the cherry on top. The roughness of the waves can be changed depending on settings or wind conditions, and we get this cool video showing a parting of the waves as Blackrack was playing with some of the Gersner and FFT settings with the caption here, where have I seen this before? It also reminds me of that water planet from the movie Interstellar when the giant wave comes in, and it got me thinking that I kind of hope somebody mods in that kind of planet with giant waves that move across the surface so that landings have to be carefully planned around them. Next, Lynx gave us a look at the procedure complex craters which will make for some really unique landing zones and could also be really cool places to build colonies. They kind of give me frost punk vibes which I really like. Next we got to look at some more of Black Rack's work, this time cloud shadows that are currently a work in progress but once again this could easily be the finished product and I would already be impressed. These really add a degree of depth and give a better sense of scale from higher altitudes so again just a really great touch that adds a lot. Josh also gave us a quick look at vessel reflections going over how stars and atmosphere are reflected off of, in this case, a metallic surface. Again, showing off just how much lighting can contribute to that sense of wonderment that the dev team is going for. And in my opinion, absolutely nailing. Next, we got another update from Daishi on parts progress. But what's really cool is we got a little bit of information here that is somewhat new and really exciting. They mentioned that there are plans to give hardcore players access to individual subparts and a user interface so that they can build their own custom parts. This is of course in conjunction with pre-made parts for users who wish to play a more casual game or just have no interest in what I am assuming might be a way to engage in min-maxing your craft. By the way, these textures and reflections and everything about these new parts is looking really great. So just a massive shout out to everybody who's been working on this because it shows and it looks amazing. Moving on, Max gave us a look at the thin film interface that is being worked on and explains that this is an effect caused by light waves reflecting off of thin surfaces. This effect is often seen on bubbles, oil and water mixtures, heat blooms on metal, and the surface of some glasses. This effect creates color variants depending on the underlying materials and just gives the craft a more realistic shift in color as light moves across it. Next, Blackrack gave us another look at his progress on wave generation, and what's really cool here is we get a look at how craft will appear underwater. We can already see some minor distortions as the waves move over parts of the craft. The previous month's updates on water already looked great, but these are definitely a more natural looking wave pattern than we saw before, with a greater degree of randomness. We also got a look at some of the foam white caps that are being implemented. But my favorite update from Blackrack this period might just be this shot of Earth from space, which shows the waves acting like micro facets that give the surface a rougher or smoother appearance depending on how wavy things are at the moment in that given area. This really gives off that blue marble feeling, like the photo from Apollo 17, and comparing this to the very first images we got of Earth when the game was first announced is night and day. It's kind of hard to remember just how far things have come along when you don't see them right next to each other. Next, Lynx gave us a look at the first small astronomical body in the game. With just an 11 kilometer mean radius, this is Phobos, one of Mars's moons, being used to test their system of billboarding on small bodies with high relative deformities. I'm assuming this work will also be applied to asteroids and other astronomical bodies as well, so it's really neat to see that spherical billboarding doesn't only work on spheres. And I saved the best for last. I don't, I don't know about the best, but probably Probably what most would consider to be the biggest update we have gotten over this period of time is the new Kitten model engine. This is rendered in Brutal, and while it doesn't yet include lighting or shadows, it shows off the application of both animations and expressions. We can also see a clear direction now in proportions and art style, and while this is still a work in progress, I can say I am loving the direction that they are moving in. Dean says to expect this to improve later on, especially once it's in the game and benefiting from lighting and shadows, plus everything else that comes with that, but he also mentions that this is already working and rendering really well in Brutal because the pipeline was made from scratch and therefore doesn't contain a lot of legacy see bloat or outdated modals. It instead uses only what's needed and the most modern approaches to those applications. Right now, the expressions are limited, but as this one gets more fleshed out, we are told to expect many more to come. And obviously, this is massive because now that there is a fleshed out model that can be rendered in Brutal, there is one less hurdle standing in the way of them creating a game that is ready to be played. I am personally a big fan of this kitten model, and it took one of two paths I was hoping to see which were either basically what we're seeing here with the proportions shown, but I also would have been happy with a style that had the cats walking on all four paws some of the time, in a style that more closely resembles the art installation I showed from my travels in Japan. But what do you guys think? Obviously this isn't a finished product, but what would you change 
if anything. I think they have done a great job steering away from the uncanny valley that some people felt was a little too close in previous iterations. I am excited to see these models in game with a full benefit of lighting and shadows coming up here hopefully pretty soon. So if you want to stay up to date on Kitten Space Agency and follow along with the development progress together, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you want to help my channel and others find this video, be sure to give it a massive thumbs up so that the algorithm knows to show it to more people. And if you feel like supporting my channel, it's never expected, but always appreciated as it helps me dedicate more time to making videos and keeping you informed. You can click the links in the description to either buy me a coffee or support me through Patreon. And to those of you who do, thank you so much. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.